Welcome to the well. You are watching The Well at New Covenant with pastors Tim and Barbara Rigdon. We hope you are blessed by today's message. Come as you are. You won't leave the same. I've been one messed up puppy when it comes to the things of God here lately. God's just been revealing some things that I feel like they're pertinent for the body of Christ that I haven't seen. Last week we began to talk about re redemptive identity <laughs> and how we found out that even like blind Bartimaeus, his name was not Bartimaeus. It was Bar, which meant son, and Timaeus, which meant of honor. <laughs> so he was son of honor, but yet he was living as a beggar. <laughs> and I believe the body of Christ is we've, we've lived below the standard of what God would have us to for too long. But it's because we haven't understood the fullness of the identity that God has for our lives. And what God wants to bless us with. You know, uh, the scripture says that he, want, that he wants you to know the things that accompany salvation. So, you know, I want to talk more about those things that accompany salvation. Now, we know that there's all kinds of deals. Like, we know that healing is there. We know deliverance. We know blessings. We know uh, all these things begin to manifest when you get into the true identity of Christ. And even Romans chapter 8 it says this in the, in the Passion Translation. It says, As all creation is standing upon tippy-toe, waiting for the revealing of the sons and daughters of God. <laughs> and I believe the sons and daughters of God need to rise up to their place in God. And God wants to release us into our identity so that we can be who we've been called to be. A lot of folks don't realize. They, they think, well, I come to church. I got saved. Hallelujah. And I'm trying to live a good Christian life. There I've done my duty, and I'm going to heaven. <laughs> Jesus didn't die to give you a ticket to get to heaven. Jesus didn't die just to give you a get out of hell free card. Jesus died so that he could restore back what was lost in the garden. And it was the true identity of Christ being on the earth, the identity of the Lord, hallelujah, but it was also the, to be the image bearers of God, but it was the authority. Do you realize in the beginning that God gave Adam the authority to name all the Adams? Um, name all the animals, not all the Adams. <laughs> he gave him authority for them, for him to name the animals. <laughs> See, there's a lot of things on this world that God's gave us authority that we lost in the garden to go and speak out and to speak what this is what this is supposed to be. Like Adam, he went and he said, this, is a, you know, this has got long legs and a long neck and spots on it. That's going to be a giraffe. And since the beginning of time, what Adam called things have been established. But when he ate of the tree of, of knowledge of good and evil, all of a sudden he did what God said not to do. And what happened was that he had an inappropriate appetite. And because of his inappropriate appetite, he began to lose his identity. That's the reason when they come, God came in the cool of the day, and he said, said, where are you, Adam? It ain't like he didn't know where they were, but all of a sudden they were hiding themselves. It was the first religious act. Hallelujah. They were hiding their sin, hiding the fact that they had eaten of that tree. And it was the appetite for something they wasn't supposed to do. Have you not realized that even children, I've seen, I seen it this weekend. We've got our grandbaby and, and our, our kids in this weekend. And was down at the camper, and there's a stereo there in the camper, and it's got all these buttons. Well, it's got speakers on. They don't work always good, but uh, they got there about one o'clock in the morning, and our neighbors were never there because we're never down there on the weekends, but they were there. And so Lane went over, and he starts pressing all the buttons, <laughs> and he found out what the the speakers outside, which button locked them in, and he found out what that big blue knob was for that was lit up. And so at 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock in the morning, he goes, nin, 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 and just starts all this loud. Music. We're like, oh, well, <laughs> well, I seen something. I seen his mama, first she started out, Lane, no. <laughs> Popped his hands like good mamas do. I said, no. Well, then I seen, because our, he is a Rigdon. <laughs> I seen him get this little smirky grin and look at it, and he's like in slow motion 
going back to that which he's been told no. He's going right back to the very thing that he was told he can't touch. <laughs> Next thing I know, Daddy had to get involved, and Daddy didn't just smack his hands. Daddy smacked his butt. <laughs> I mean, can I say butt in church? Hallelujah. I just did. <laughs> I, he popped him on the rear end, and it, it was like you killed him. And I mean, it was just a little pop. He's like, eh. <laughs> and I realized that even with, before I already had been working on this message, I said, that's the way that we are as Christians. We've been told no by the Father. <laughs> And then when we go and we do something, we touch something, we think, well, they're just trying to hinder me from being what I'm supposed to be. And it's not that. It's a boundary that God is trying to set upon your life because when you got a river flowing through you, glory to God, if it's a river without boundaries, it's just a flood. Yeah. <laughs> but when the boundaries come there, that's where the current can you say current? The current gets stronger because the rivers, and the higher the banks of the river, the more power or current can flow through that. And I believe that there's a powerful river of God that wants to flow through the body of Christ, but it's been lost because we lost our identity in the garden, and we've lost the authority that we had there, and therefore we're still going over to the shiny buttons and those things that glitter in our eyes and get our attention, and we're touching what God said don't touch. We're... <coughs> I'm preaching better than your amen in right now. <laughs> Hallelujah. We're touching what God said don't touch, and we're doing what God said not to do, and we're not doing what God said to do. <laughs> and because of that, you know, we realize and we say, and we're like a little kid. We just stomp our feet when we're told no, and we're just like, wah, 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 and we're acting like a bunch of children right now in the body of Christ because, God, I wanted this, and I wanted this from my life. I wanted a, a husband, or I wanted a wife, and I wanted 2.3 kids, and <coughs> white picket fence. That's the average, by the way. <coughs> I wanted all these things, or I want a new car, or I want this, or I want that, and I want this, and I... And we get so caught up on what we want, we never ask the Father, what do you want? We never ask God what you want. And I believe that that's where we miss God a lot. But I believe the reason we do it is because we've lost our true identity. We've not been the image bearers that God's called us to be. Amen. Hallelujah. So I want to talk to you today. We'll see if this works today. Hallelujah. I want to talk to you about beloved identity. Beloved identity. Now, see, we talked about redemptive identity where God's going to buy you back. But this is where we're trying to get to, is the beloved identity. Let's read some scripture and make this official. Matthew chapter 3, verse 13 says this. Then Jesus came to Galilee to John at the, at the Jordan to be baptized by him. I think what's really interesting about here, if you go to the verses before it, where was John at? He was in the wilderness. See, John knew how to embrace the wilderness experience to see that it's part of, uh, when you go through the wilderness, it's part of bringing you into the identity that you are. <laughs> what do you mean, Pastor? It's like this. I've heard my wife say this several times, <laughs> and several of y'all are the same way. She says, you know, all my family were hard workers. All my family, we appreciate things because we grew up poor, and so when we got something, we took care of it. And us. Why? She was a victim of her raisins in a good way. <laughs> Amen. And it's because that we take on the identity of what, when we start to submit to things around about us. And I think right here that John the Baptist, said, just like Barb talked about, she said, we didn't have nothing grow up. We was poor, didn't know we was poor until we, you know, we got to school and we realized, hey, we don't have new dresses and new shoes and all that. But all of a sudden, through those things, that made her who she is today. Because her and her, her family, they embraced the wilderness that they were in, and it made them... In the, they came out and started walking in the blessings. John the Baptist is in the wilderness, but it was in the wilderness that began to be revealed who he was. Because why? Everybody from town, everybody was coming out to the wilderness. He didn't go into the town. They came out to the wilderness to get baptized. Amen? Including Jesus. His identity didn't get to be revealed until he stepped out and he began to rise up in the wilderness. And right here it says in verse 14, And John tried to prevent him, talking about Jesus, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And you're coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit me to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he allowed him. <laughs> How would you like to be the one called of God to baptize Jesus? <laughs> is that not, that's heavy there. 
And I'm sure we would feel the same way as John. I'm not even worthy to do it. I'm not even, one version said, I'm not even worthy to lace up your sandals. I'm not worthy to do anything with you. But yet God had chosen John because John had been in the wilderness. And the wilderness didn't break him. The wilderness maked him. See, what you're going through is not there to break you up and bust you up and put you down. It's there to build you up and make you into the person that God's calling you to be. It's there to reveal the true identity. Luke chapter 1 verse 81 says, says that, uh, that John waxed strong in the spirit and grew strong in the spirit all of his days in the wilderness until his day of manifestation to all of Israel. See, we keep wanting to be manifested. We keep wanting to, oh, I want my ministry, and I want this, and I want to be able to do that, and I want to do this. But we're not willing to walk through the identity-forming process, which some call wilderness, but I believe it's an image-bearer process. <laughs> See, it's in the image-bearing process that is revealed who you are. Because you can say, I'm a mad of faith and I'm a mighty woman of faith and I'm, I'm powerful in the Lord but yet when hard times come are you complaining to God? When the hard times come are you ready to quit on God? Are you ready to lay it down? Since during those hard times or it, the old song says in the valley and when we're in that valley that's when it's really revealed what kind of faith you are, you got what kind of walk with God do you really have? See it's there that it reveals your true identity your true character, if you would. And I believe that this is what was happening to John. But what was manifesting with John started to manifest with Jesus by Jesus being obedient to go to the wilderness. Look what happened. When he, came, he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. <laughs> Amen. Look here. I skipped one there. <clears throat> Sorry, there's a verse 17. Let me finish reading. And they saw the Spirit of, the, of God descending like a dove and was lighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son. <clears throat> this is my beloved Son. <laughs> Amen. Amen. All of a sudden, God Almighty prophesied over his own son and began to proclaim his true identity upon the earth. This is my beloved son. And all of a sudden, beloved identity was revealed all of God Jesus so he could reveal it through us. Amen. If Jesus had never went through the process of receiving beloved identity, we could never have that process. But all of a sudden, what God knew and beforehand, hallelujah, he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross. But before all that took place, before our salvation took place, he began to restore the identity back to the body of Christ. <laughs> this is my beloved son. My is a personal pro pronoun. God saying, this is my son. Not just my son, but my beloved son. Hallelujah. This is my beloved son. Hallelujah. Beloved identity began to be established. But he said, in whom I'm well pleased. Look what all goes right here in Corinthians. Hallelujah. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, therefore, if anyone, everybody say anyone. If anyone is a new creation, Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. I don't care what your identity that you carried in here today or what your identity you carried in before you went to the Lord. Glory to God. All things have become new. Hallelujah. I love this new identity that he's saying right here. You're going to take on a new identity. Now, listen to me very closely. This is what the Lord spoke to me about this. Your new identity is not a new, improved, better fall on you. I'm going to say it again so you can't. It's not a new, you, improved, fallen you. See, Adam had fallen, so our Adam nature, we're in a fallen nature. And Jesus didn't die on the cross so we can just be a better version of our old Adam. He died so we could take on a new identity. The old things have passed away. Our old identity, our fallen nature. Amen. Our fallen identity are being wiped out right now. <laughs> Do you understand that? <laughs> now, I know this is, don't look at me like a cow at a new gate now. <laughs> if you can catch this, 
This will change your life. This has changed my life. As God showed me this years ago, but now he's bringing more revelation to it. Barb and I sat around just in studying and talking to the Lord, and it's every day God's saying, beloved identity, beloved identity. You're blessed because you're walking as an image bearer in the beloved identity of Christ. When you take on old things that pass away and you take on, behold, all things that become new, all of a sudden your new identity begins to be revealed and all of a sudden God can use you in a capacity like he's never used before. Now, here's the thing. You think, well, why is this such a big thing? This is such a big deal that Jesus was tempted in his beloved identity. He was tempted in his beloved identity. When you go from Matthew 3, immediately it says Matthew 4, Hallelujah. Verse 1, he says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit. And I've preached this before. That's a capital S. It's a personal pronoun. That means the Spirit of God. So the Spirit of God led him where? To the wilderness. To be what? Tempted by the devil. <laughs> Why do we always we say, Oh, I just want to be more like you, Jesus. When we say that in church, and we're just like, Oh, more like you, Jesus. I just want more of you, Jesus, more of you. But the Bible says we've been called to be co-sufferers of him in his crucifixion. We're supposed to go through some things. Jesus even said he learned obedience through the things he suffered. But he will cry out, Lord, I want more like Jesus. I just want to be like Jesus. Give me a WWJD t-shirt and a bracelet and put a bumper sticker on my car. What would Jesus do? That's what I'm going to do. No, you're not, because as soon as the wilderness comes in, hallelujah, then we start complaining and we start whining and saying, God, why are you tempting me, Lord? Why am I going through this? Why is this wilderness time? Lord, I thought I was doing things right. I started going to church. Glory to God. I've been there three Sundays in a row, and yet things ain't changing, God. I even give some in an offering pot today, and I ain't seen no difference because you're not like Jesus yet. You're still walking in your fallen man mentality when God says, I want to give you a new identity that's a beloved identity. When you walk in beloved identity, all things pass away. And guess what? He reigns on the just and the unjust, and many are the afflictions of the righteous, but my God will deliver you out of them all. And so by that, glory to God, I may be going through hell, but glory to God, I'm still going, and I'm coming out the other side because I'm walking in my identity. I'm walking in who God called me to be, how God called me to be be it. Amen. Amen. <laughs> when you understand that you are the beloved of the Lord, how many times throughout Scripture does it not go on? And I, I'll probably get in on this some more this next few weeks. I don't know. I just can't get off of it. How many times did Paul write and he says, beloved, dearly beloved. How come preachers and, and traditional wedding services, dearly beloved, we are gathered here today. They're prophesying over you and you didn't know it. <laughs> A prophesying beloved identity. Beloved, I, I guess you, he said, beloved, that you would greet each other with a holy kiss. <laughs> beloved, lift up holy hands without wrath or doubting. <laughs> See, it's all through the scripture. <laughs> Even John the Revelator, not John the Baptist, John the Revelator, he called him the beloved. <laughs> How many wants Jesus to call you the beloved? <laughs> I want beloved identity. <laughs> Look here, he was led into the wilderness. <laughs> led in the wilderness to be tempted the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterwards he was hungry. <laughs> Glory to God. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, <laughs> now I want you to catch up right here. <laughs> this will, you'll, I'll just do it. If you are, if you are, regular King James says, if you be, if you be the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. <laughs> Do you realize right here, as he's being tempted, he's not being tempted to turn stones to bread. He's been tempted on his beloved identity. <laughs> the enemy is not trying to get him. The devil, he's not trying to come and tell him to turn uh, uh, stones to bread. And you know, I mean, I'll read the next verse real quick. But he said to him, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. What had just proceeded out of the mouth of God? What was the last thing he heard God say? This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. <laughs> Every word that flows out. See, he wasn't tempted to turn the bread, the stones into bread. He wasn't tempted to be tossed down off the temple and exalt himself up. He wasn't tempted in all these three different times. Every time he said, if you be the Son of God, if you truly be the image bearer restored, if you truly be the beloved identity coming back to the earth, 
Then you wonder why you come to church and you start walking with God. And then your fallen man begins to rise up and you fall short of the glory of God. And then you got those naysayers around about you. <laughs> huh? Look at you. If you be a Christian, why you do that? <laughs> if you really born again, if you go to church, why did you do that? <laughs> And that's one of the hardest things to deal with in your Christian walk. Because, see, those that are not forgiven, those that have not taken on beloved identity, don't realize that we still come short of the glory of God. Those that have not received the beloved identity and understand the fullness of grace in their life, they don't understand the fact that I didn't become perfect. I become perfectly loved and perfectly forgiven. Not perfect in my actions always. Now, that's not an excuse. Romans chapter 6 verse 1 says, Shall we sin that grace may abide? And verse 2 says, God forbid. It's not an excuse. And, and, I, and, and I'm, I'm getting tired of hearing preachers and uh, people that are so dogmatic and legalistic pointing out faults and saying, Well, you're just giving everybody a license to sin. Guess what? That's what upset all the Pharisees in Jesus' time. It's because he came in telling them, You shall not be saved by what? But you're going to be saved by grace, by faith. By faith. The just shall walk by faith. The righteousness of God comes by faith. See, if you could earn your salvation, everybody would do it. That's why it takes a childlike faith. Amen? As we're growing up and God takes us back to childhood, He takes us back to that childlike faith. See, that childlike faith, that when you're a child and they've hurt themselves and they're crying, and they come and they reach up for you. And as soon as you pick them up, everything gets better. So that's the way you need to come to Daddy God. You may be crying out because you're in that wilderness place. And you're being tempted. And you're going through things. And your beloved identity is being tempted. And you're struggling with things. But when you come in and you reach up to Abba Father. And he begins to embrace you. Embraces you with grace. Hallelujah. Like that prodigal father. The embrace of grace. Hallelujah. That hug. That hug that takes away all the cares of the world. It comes when we start walking in this beloved identity. It comes when we start realizing who we are in Christ. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. It comes when we realize that, yeah, at times I'm going to be tested in my beloved identity. And I may even question myself in my beloved identity. See, I believe there's people that question your salvation sometimes. <laughs> and I believe if you question your salvation, you've never really got truly secured in your beloved identity. Because beloved identity doesn't change. <clears throat> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stretch your theology, and there's probably going to be somebody send me some emails, and maybe even people talk to me. But I'm gonna, I want to stretch it, and I feel like that you're mature enough to handle it. I'm going to throw you some meat out. It's simplistic. It's meat. I ain't seasoned it up. I ain't salted it up. I ain't sugared it up. But I'm going to tell you like it is right here. Here it is. I never got good enough to come to God. You never got good enough to come to Jesus. Anybody here or anybody watching, you can never get good enough to come to God. Never. But because of grace, you were saved. And you received that grace by faith. So let me ask you something. If I can never get good enough to, to come to God, can I ever be bad enough to get away from God? That stretches you, don't it? That's straight. Pastor, you're saying once in grace, always grace. Here's what I'm saying. I'm saying once in grace, always in grace if you stay in grace. When you stay in your beloved identity and you realize who you are in the Lord, you're not going to want to go back. When I'm truly born again, I think that's the key factor. When I'm truly born again, not when I'm truly sorry, not when I've come and said a prayer, if the goal of churches is nothing more than to get as many people as we can to run down to an altar and repeat a prayer, we've missed what God's trying to do. <laughs> We're not here to get everybody to come down and everybody to say a pretty prayer and then we can walk out of here and say, yes, what, we had so many decisions today. It ain't about a decision. It's about a beloved identity being instilled into you, hallelujah, and the righteousness of God being imputed into you and receiving your inheritance as a child of God. See, we think we only receive our inheritance when we get on the other side. 
you receive your inheritance here. It just keeps multiplying and manifesting over when we get to heaven. Amen. But you can walk in your inheritance now. Well, I don't know if I agree with that, Pastor. You don't have to. How about this? How many believes that God can heal? That's on this side of heaven. You know there's not going to be no healing in heaven because there ain't no need for healing. Is that not an inheritance? How many believes that God can bless people financially? I, I don't need no money when I get to heaven. I mean, God, he paved his driveway with gold. That's how, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? All the silver and gold is his, hallelujah, you know? So I'm not needing it when I get there. I need the inheritance of God on my life on this side. I need the blessings of God. And I'm just telling you those things that accompany salvation. But here's the thing. You, how many believes God delivers still? Delivers and sets free from drugs, alcohol, sin, hallelujah, pornography, all those things. He can set people free of mindsets in their life. He does it, but he does it on this side of glory. Why? Because it's an inheritance of the sons and daughters of God. Those who are truly taken on the identity of Christ and said, I want that beloved identity in my life. See, that's the problem, though. We've got too many people saying they made a decision because somebody led them through and said, repeat after me. Y'all got quiet now. Thank you, Reese. I need your amens over there, buddy. <laughs> it's got to go beyond repeating a prayer. There has to be an encounter that when you get up from an altar of God, you ain't the same as you went down. <laughs> Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. That's the type of encounter of Christ I'm talking about this morning. I'm not talking about repeating pretty prayers. Thank God for the pretty prayers. I'm not knocking it. But here's the thing. It's got to go beyond that. That's the reason we see people come and they kneel down in churches and altars all across America and they leave the same way they came. And hallelujah, they say, they say well, you got saved. You, got a, you, had a, uh, you, you made a decision. And we mark it up and we check the boxes in our churches and we turn them into headquarters and we say, we had this many today. Glory to God, don't we look good as preachers? But yet they go out the door and they live the same way as they did before they came in. And there was no change. There was no lifestyle change. There was no holiness, no purity, no, no deliverance. All there was was a religious experience for a few moments and it never changed their hearts. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let me rope my breeches legs. It's getting deep. <laughs> Hallelujah. We're going in deeper. Why? I'm not here today to get a bunch of people to pr pray the prayer. What I'm here today is to challenge your thinking that if all you've done is repeat a prayer, you need a counter with the Holy Ghost. You need an encounter with the beloved identity of Jesus today. And that encounter will change you forever. If you say, well, pastor, I'm still struggling with this, and I'm still struggling with that, and I still go back to this old way or whatever. I'm not saying you're not saved. What I'm saying is, check your heart. Do you really have beloved identity? Have you really been changed? Or did you just go through the motions of relig religiosity? We're not here for a pharmaceutical moment. We're here for beloved identity to be instilled in us. Because guess what? I didn't earn beloved identity. I can't earn beloved identity. I can't take it on myself. I can't say, well, I think I'm going to get beloved identity today. It has to be imputed or given to me by him. And if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is the Lord and he's risen from the dead and you cry out to him from your heart, not the words in your mouth. The words out of your mouth, uh, that's not what's important right now. It's how hard and how loud your heart cries out. When your heart cries out by faith, Jesus, come into my heart, forgive me, change me, make me more like you, God. Give me beloved identity. Not because somebody said repeat this, but because your heart truly cries that out. That's what changes things. I want to stretch it. I'll probably build a message off this, but God's been dealing with me for years. <coughs> and many of you have heard me say this statement. 
and the Lord told me I was, I was theologically wrong. <coughs> Correct me. I've said, more, Lord. I want more Jesus. More, Lord. <coughs> and the Lord told me, he said, Tim, I don't give you all me. The problem is not on my end of it. The problem's on your end, Tim. <coughs> there needs to be less of you. Well, see, we think, <coughs> okay, now I'm going to become holy before the Lord. Now I'm going to start quitting this and quitting that. I'm going to start reading my Bible. I'm going to start praying regularly. I'm going to start coming to church regularly. I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do. And I'm going to die to self. And I'm going to make room for more Jesus. <coughs> and then we try that. And it works for a while. And then we're right back to where we used to be. <coughs> and the Lord showed me the process of why that happens. Because <coughs> we're trying to empty ourselves of the world so we can fit more God in there. When what God wants to do is you to cry out to Him, and He just starts to put so much God inside of you that it begins to squeeze out the world that's inside of Him. <laughs> it's like we had some old holes in this old building was filling up, and I love spray foam. That insulator, anybody? Ever? <laughs> Brother Larry says, I feel a witness on that. <laughs> you can. Spray foam covers a multitude of faults. <laughs> uh, but I put some spray foam, and I, I, I still, you know, I'll fill that hole up so much. You know, I know you're supposed, it's called expanding foam. <clears throat> and I know you're only supposed to spray a little bit in there and then let it do its thing, and it just begins to swell up. <laughs> but I never got that right. Brother Sean's in the booth. He's sitting there nodding and says, Yeah, I had to clean up a lot of pastor stuff. <laughs> but I would spray that stuff. Then all of a sudden, it'd be coming out the hole. Next thing I know, it's just expanding over everything. <laughs> and the Lord said, Why won't you do that with me, Tim? Why will you not let me spray my spirit inside of your heart and your life to where it just begins to push out everything that ain't of me? <laughs> where there's nothing inside of you but me, Tim. That's where God's trying to, the expansion of the Holy Ghost. He said he wants to expand our borders. Maybe he wants to expand borders inside your own heart. Stretch forth your tent pegs. Stretch forth your cords. Maybe that needs to begin in here. See, we've taken those words and we said, well, Lord, that means you're perfect. You're giving me more territory. You're doing all this. God wants the territory of your heart. And you can't take territory for God until you let God take the territory of your heart. <laughs> Expansion. <laughs> it's not much, it's just so much of God. He's pushing out everything that's not of Him. <laughs> All of a sudden, when I take on that, and it just begins to come out, just like I said, when I'd spray them holes, they come out, it got on everything. That all of a sudden, the God that's inside of you gets on everything you touch. Gets on every place you walk. Gets every place you go that God is squishing out of you. And he's pouring out upon him. That's beloved identity. Let me tell you this. Beloved identity, when we go to the fullest extent of beloved identity, when the demons see you, they don't see you. They see Jesus. How in the world, exactly, how in the world do you think we can fulfill what Jesus said that not only these great things he did, but greater things shall you do? You can't go into greater things if they're not seeing Jesus in you. If you're not walking in beloved identity, I believe him. when we walk down the street, there's a new thing about to happen to people. People are not going to recognize you. You say, well, I like people to recognize you. Of course. Because our personal old man fallen identity wants recognition. Our old man wants to be recognized. Our old man wants to be patted on the back. Our old man needs acceptance. Our old man needs all these things that only come from the Father, but we're looking for it through man. But when we lay that down and we take on the true beloved identity, that all of a sudden when we walk down the street and everybody don't recognize us, that we begin to look more like him, that they say, man, there's something different about that person. You, had ever, you ever had somebody at work, somebody where you're at, and they're just like, man, it's just something different about you. Would you, uh, you know, and all of a sudden they perceive there's something different about you. Then all of a sudden they want what you got. That's because maybe you've got true 
beloved identity and you don't have a religious experience. Of course it is a religious experience when you take on beloved identity. I'm not, I'm not saying it's not. But if we're just going through religious traditions of repeating prayers, we've missed God. We've missed God as a church. We've missed God as leadership. We've missed the Lord. Because I believe that true revival is when God's people begin to be walk in their true identity. Because when you walk in your true identity, remember when Jesus walked on the scene, demons cried out. When Jesus walked on the scene, hallelujah, people were healed. People were touched. <laughs> I believe it's all part of taking on the whole armor of God. When you're walking with the whole armor of God, everybody, y'all ever seen them old medieval armor suits? I wish I had an armor suit. And they got them helmets on. And you can't tell who's in there, can you? Unless they raise it up. And the Lord began to show me that the true armor of God, when you take on His armor, it's part of taking on His identity. And when you take on the true beloved identity of God, that when you walk around, the devil don't know it ain't Jesus walking around. You know the only time that he can tell it ain't Jesus? When you lack faith and you raise that thing up and say, did that work? You start peeking out of your identity. When you don't truly believe. I believe that God's taken our church and believers alike, those that step into true identity, we're going to step into a new realm of, uh, of miracles. What does he say about the church? God just started showing me this stuff here in the last couple of weeks. He said this. He said, if any sick is among you, he said, you can lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Mark 16. These signs shall follow them that believe. You lay hands on the sick. See, I believe we're going to a place that we don't even have to say nothing. I believe that God's trying to take us to a place of true identity, that we're walking into the identity of Christ, that all we do is we walk and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you. Don't have to say nothing. Don't have to say a word. That we're just releasing by faith. And I know that just stretches people. Well, I've got to know what to pray, and I've got to know what to say. Of course we've got to learn to pray and all those things. But sometimes it's just a touch. Why? Because God said, these signs will follow them that believe. He said, they shall lay hands on the sea. Those that believe. In other words, those that are walking in true, beloved identity, they're going to lay hands on the sick, and the sick's going to recover. <laughs> Have you wondered why you've prayed everything you know to pray, and you've bound all you know to bound, and you've loosed all you know to loose, and you've agreed with everybody coming and going, and yet you're still faced with circumstance and still faced with a situation? Maybe it's because we're not walking in true identity. That beloved identity of Christ. Because when we st I believe there's a place in God, and I'm not saying I've arrived. Here's what I am saying. I say this about this church. I say this about myself. We may not have arrived at the spot, but glory to God, I have arrived on the path. Yeah. When we understand, we may not be where we need to be, but bless God, we're on the right road. When you understand you're on the road to beloved identity, you're on the road to redemptive identity, you're on the road to seeing miracles manifested, to seeing the hand of God and salvation and revival breaking loose, I may not be there at the spot, but glory to God, I'm on my way. Can you say amen? God revealed that to Pastor Barb and I going to Indiana, up to Indianapolis this week. Lord spoke to us and said, you ain't on the spot yet, but you're on the path to the spot. <laughs> if you'll receive that word today, you may not have arrived yet where you're supposed to be, but you're on the right path right now. <laughs> and when you're on the right path, beloved identity can begin to be manifested. <laughs> These signs shall follow them that believe. These signs shall follow those who are walking as an image bearer. These signs shall follow them that walk in true beloved identity. They shall lay hands on the sick and the sick shall recover. <laughs> and he goes through the whole list there of what can manifest. But it manifests through the true sons and daughters of God being revealed to the earth. <laughs> Romans 8 says it. I've said it so many times here recently. That all of creation is longing and, learn, and yearning or standing on tiptoe 
for the revealing or the manifestation, King James says, the manifestation of the sons and daughters of God. What does that mean? That means there's a lost and dying world out there that's waiting to see you step into that true beloved identity and be revealed as a son or a daughter of God and be manifested as a son and daughter of God. Uh, 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 Luke 181, when John the Baptist was in the wilderness until all the days of his manifestation to all of Israel. Manifest means revealing. Manifest. Reveal. God wants to reveal who you truly are. No longer are we going to be closet Christians. <laughs> no longer are we going to be hidden out. No longer are we going to be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. <laughs> you know, I can say that out to you, and everybody here say, Well, I ain't ashamed of Jesus. I ain't ashamed of Jesus. <laughs> are you ashamed to lay hands on people in Walmart? <laughs> are, you, are you ashamed? Of, <laughs> hallelujah. <clears throat> this is going to happen to somebody this week. <laughs> I, Lord, just stirred up. I'm praying it ain't me. But... <laughs> I just had a vision of somebody sitting at a red light and looking over at somebody and you tell them something's going on and you just get out of your car at the red light and go over and lay hands on them and drive in the car next to you. That will stretch even me. <laughs> but God wants to stretch our faith. He wants to stretch us. He wants us to go beyond ourselves. Why? You know what Jesus did? Jesus just walked along. Here. Miracle there, manifestation there, salvation. Added to the church 3,000 here. Added to the church 5,000 there. Why? By just walking along, going through life. But he didn't always take the shortest point between things. He was willing to take the long path. I'm getting into some more stuff here. <coughs> let, me, let me release this right quick. I won't go deep in it. But we've wanted the short path for so long. We wanted, okay, I want to be what God wants me to be. I want to be in this. Okay, then, boom, I'm going to go try to take a shortcut to get to it right here rather than take the long path to get into true identity. Take the long path to get into true purpose. To take the long path to get into the true manifestation that God and the revealing that God wants in your life. To take the long path to truly reveal the ministry that God's got not only to flow to you, but to flow through you. We say long path. What are you talking about, Pastor? I'm talking about no longer we're going to take shortcuts. No longer we're going to think, okay, I'm going to come into church and I'm going to hit so many services in a row and I'm going to jump up and down and I'm going to shout and I'm going to pay this much money here and this much money there and then God's going to do this. When you begin to trust God that no matter what it looks like, I'm still on the right path, Lord, and I'm going to bloom where you planted me, and God, and I'm going to do what you've called me to do, and I'm going to see the full manifestation of the identity of Christ. See, there's about to be something manifest in some people's lives here that you don't realize. God is grooming you for purpose. He's grooming you for destiny. He's grooming you for the plans of God. Because he's grooming you for the true identity of beloved identity. Today, you've got to make a decision, though. You know, here it comes. This is that point. This is where we've got to be real with God. Am I truly walking in true beloved identity? And I'm not trying to get people to question your salvation. That's not what today's about. What I'm wanting you to do is question whether you're walking in beloved identity. Well, what you do is question where the fact, okay, God, am I truly being who I'm called to be? Am I truly on the right path to the place? I may not have arrived yet, but am I truly on that path? Because if you're not on that path, you're not going to get there. And I'm going to tell you, it's a long path sometimes. Well, I don't believe that, bro. Why are you saying that? Because God said some of the fruit of the Spirit was long-suffering was willing to go through things, was willing to deal with things. Everything I see Jesus do. See, we're all complaining. Did you know that Jesus spent 30 years of preparation before he did one miracle? 30 years of preparation. You spent three months and you're saying, where is it at, Lord? Where is it at? There's a preparation time. And God's wanting to prepare you for beloved identity.